You're listening to That's Pretty Dark. The podcast where we talk about all of the entertainment that scared us as children and still haunts us as adults. So grab your flashlight and join us as we take a frightfully nostalgic look over our shoulders and under our beds and in our closets. And together we'll realize, whoa, that's pretty that's dark. Pretty dark. At this season, when the sun dies, the powers of darkness exercise great and evil influence over all things. On November Eve, by certain incantations, the dead can be made to appear and answer questions. But for this purpose, blood must be sprinkled on the dead body when it rises. For it is said that spirits love blood. The color excites them and give them for the time, the power, and the semblance of life. (laughs) So we are in Ireland, (laughs) just to confirm Uh, where we're at. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sometimes. That sounds good to me. I want to be in Ireland. That was a reading from Mm. Lady Wilde. Yeah, we referenced this book before. Listen to our Jake and the Leprechaun episode. That's right. Yeah, I just thought I'd kick us off with a really spooky reading. We're going to do some more reading today. I didn't know that spirits like blood. I've never heard that before. I have only... Never, not one time. Yeah, I've only known the like... I guess I've heard that before, but I've only seen it really done in Reanimator. Never seen that? No. They use blood? Yeah. As part of the... It's it's really just a uh, an undead corpse, but... See, yeah. Yeah. Blood feels very human. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite, not spiritual at all. Quite tangible for a spirit. But this does say the dead body rises, so who knows? Who knows? Yeah, we don't maybe know what it's, a zo- on Halloween. It's, it's a zombie. It's a vampire. We've talked about how all these things are so closely related. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. and on that note, this is that's pretty dark. It sure is. My name's Christian. My name is Kaylin. I feel honestly very aware of my own bones right now. Do you ever get that feeling? Is this a neurodivergent thing? Well, no, but you are wearing a uh, you know a uh, I do <laughs> shirt. I have one. I, I see skeleton. Your, I see your rib cage. Yeah, <laughs> it's way up. I, th- I think it's. I don't know if it's anatomically accurate to my person, but uh, I don't think so. It's a pretty no. wide gap. Yeah. Between right. Yeah. I don't know. I always feel very aware of my bones, but today more so. I just left the chiropractor, and I just well, that might do it. Crackled all over, like pop rocks. You should read that Ray Bradbury story about the guy who becomes obsessed with the fact that there's a skeleton living inside of him. That's really, I get that. I strangely f- understand. <laughs> yeah, he slowly goes insane. Mm. It's pretty good. It's in his uh, October Country collection of short stories. Well, I'll just have to go pick that up. You should. I just, I feel, the older that I get, I feel my bones more every day. Wow. <laughs> it's good for Halloween. It's spooky season, okay? It's spooky season. And this is part two of our History of Halloween series, y'all. Part two. As we discussed in part one, Samhain, the grandfather of modern-day Halloween, was both a harvest festival and a New Year's celebration, marking the point on the Celtic calendar where summer turns into winter. It was a time to both commune with the dead and divine the unpredictable future, and those who observed its traditions and participated in its festivities did so with a hearty balance of substantial hope and profound fear. Hope and fear mingling. Mm. That's Halloween. That's what I'm talking about. It's a thread that's going to weave its way all throughout this history, for sure. Throughout this history and throughout this show. Mm. Ooh. Because what, what is nostalgia if not hope? Right. It makes you, it's this wistful feeling, missing the past, but hopeful for the future. Hopeful for the future. Wow, we're so Celtic, honestly. <laughs> we're all honorary Celts in this. Hey. No matter where you're from. We'll just, I, I mean, I don't know if they would really <laughs> approve of that, but I'll... I'll take it for now. <laughs> what is it Mikey says in the Goonies? Why not? He's dead. He doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, he doesn't care. I guess not. Where we left off last time, the Celtic nations had just been colonized by Romans and appropriated by the Roman Catholic Church to create the Triduum of Death. Oh, yeah. The three-day season of morbidity consisting of All Hallows' Eve, All Hallows' Day, and All Souls Day. I think about death a lot already, so I don't feel like it would be that different for me. <laughs> right. That'd be a pretty smooth transition. Yeah. That's how the Catholics get you. <laughs> they make it relevant to your life. <laughs> yeah. That's how they got the Celts. Mm. Well, Catholicism may have swallowed up the Celtic religion over time, but as everyone knows, you are what you eat. Oh. And the truth is, if the Catholic Church hadn't supplanted pagan festivals with holy days, Halloween as we know it, never would have existed. Yeah, I really am grateful, 
honestly. Yeah, you have to be. As it's, much as all of it is kind of sad, but... sad and sucky, mm-hmm. I'm grateful for what it has brought to us. It's one of the hardest things I had to realize researching all this. It's like, wow, we wouldn't have it at all if it wasn't for those old Catholic guys. Man, mm-hmm. one of the better things they did. I'll say that Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Ironically, it was the Catholic Church's attempts to stamp out Solon's festivities that guaranteed their survival. From its humble beginnings, the church has placed a stringent emphasis on death and the afterlife, and their early adoption of the philosophy Memento Mori ultimately not only gave Halloween its macabre association with death, but also gave anyone with a passing morbid fascination the opportunity to express those curiosities by exploring and even indulging in the season. So thanks, cool Jesus. (laughs) Cool Jesus. (laughs) Thanks, corpse Jesus. Oh, yikes. What? He rose from the dead. He doesn't care. Isn't the thing he's alive. It, he doesn't care. Well, he's alive. He doesn't care. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So what? He's alive. We're just he offending care. everybody across the board, I think, at this point. <laughs> are we pro-Catholicism? Are we not? No one knows. But if you offend everybody, it's like, are you offending anybody? <laughs> and on that note, we now arrive at the period of history where most of our modern Halloween customs and superstitions were born. These are the things that many Halloween enthusiasts, self-proclaimed scholars, and armchair historians claim came from the ancient Celts. But we're done with the high school history portion of the series. Now is the time for witches, devils, and ghosts. That's what we've been waiting for. Because these are the Middle Ages. We've arrived. We've made it. This is a lot more fun. <laughs> Than the early <laughs> Samhain history. Hey, I thought it was pretty fun. I mean, I thought it was fun. I'm a nerd, but, but you know, way less in my head this time around. This it's stuff more that's fun. more familiar. So it's closer to where we are. So it's much more familiar. Less uh, just oh, speculation across the board. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I was about to say, and less guessing. Much less. We have more work. records. Thanks to the establishment of All Souls Day, All Hallow Tide got real spooky real fast. Not only was this a season to commemorate martyrs and all saints, both known and unknown, but now people had purgatory to think about. This means that any all average Jack or Jill who had died, that is, anyone who wasn't good enough to go to heaven or bad enough to go to hell, which is pretty much everybody, yeah, these were lost souls still wandering around the spiritual plane known as purgatory. It does sound pretty awful. Yeah. I'll give you that. Yeah, it became... Um, a more realistic fear than going to hell because you think the hell's reserved for the worst of the worst. You're like, well, I'm not that bad. Mm-hmm. So your actual realistic fate, your realistic fear is that you will go to purgatory. Mm-hmm. And from there, you have a very real uh, likelihood of slipping down into hell. So um, that's actually worse because you get the experience of purgatory and then the experience of mm-hmm. hell. Yeah. Yuck. And I don't, I'm not, I'm not claiming to know all about it. I'm sure there are very nuanced aspects to all those, those three different levels of fate. Uh, and I don't really know everything about it. I'm not Catholic. Thanks to our Catholic listeners. If you send any emails. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely let me know because I'm super curious. But throughout this research, I learned some of the quote unquote rules of how this works. And that factors into a lot of what the church was telling people to do in and around All Hallowtide. So if I, if I get it wrong, just let me know. Yeah. And I'll address it in the future for sure. As with everything, we're not too proud right. to take correction. So purgatory was considered a terrible fate, of course, and could result in your loved ones going to hell if you aren't careful. But there's good news. They can pass on from purgatory during All Hallowtide. Whoa. Thanks, Catholic Church. <laughs> and if you attend Mass on All Hallows' Eve to light a candle in prayer for them, you just might be able to lift them out of purgatory and into paradise. So don't go to your little fancy parties. That's a lot of work, And drink your your alcohol. A lot of pressure as well. Oh, it's a lot of pressure. Go make sure Grandpa can get to heaven, okay? But if you... (laughs) It's the pressure to live a holy life. You know what that's like. I know what that's like. Oh, I know what that's like. Because now it's not just your own soul you have to worry about. It's your relatives, your friends, your ancestors. Mm -hmm. It's everybody you love. Because, yeah, your, your prayers won't be heard. If you're not <laughs> in good standing. So, mm-hmm. wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The pressure that not only do you have to live right, but you have to 
you're responsible for that once they're gone. Yeah, totally. Just in case. So this triduum of death was introduced as a time to not only pray for your dearly departed, but also to contemplate your own eventual death. Memento mori, for anybody who doesn't know, is Latin for... Remember, you will die. Exactly. (laughs) And as though conjuring up some sense of supernatural irony, the events of the world for the next few hundred years would guarantee that nobody ever forgot. I certainly haven't. Mm -mm. And no one in the Middle Ages forgot. Absolutely not. Because most of Halloween's development occurred during the medieval period, in the beginning of the 1300s, emphasis on the number 13, (laughs) kicked off what's known as the Little Ice Age, a period of regional cooling that made for unbearably cold and elongated winters in the Northern Hemisphere. This resulted in crop failures and cattle disease that killed off roughly 80% of cattle and sheep Mm. and led to an increase in crime, illness, and excessive amounts of mortality. Malnutrition, starvation, Mm -hmm. and eventually a little thing called the Black Plague. (laughs) Hey, yeah. Those who survived would soon be met with sickness and even more death on a much more massive scale. As the Black Death swept through Europe in the mid-1300s, it's estimated that the plague killed up to 60% of Europe's population Mm -hmm. and up to 40% of England's population. It's unthinkable, truly. This is often referred to as the worst century to be alive. I don't disagree. We've had some tough times, but uh doesn't really compare. Yeah, our global pandemic was not quite the same. Thankfully. So the years of war, starvation, plague, piercing cold, torrential rain, darkness, and rampant mortality changed completely how many people viewed the world, life, and death, and even challenged their faith in the church which had all but abandoned them during this period, removing and contradicting many of the customs and restrictions they had previously set into place as things you must do if you want to have any hope of ever going to heaven. It's kind of like what you were talking about in the last episode where it was people needed comfort, people needed an an answer. Mm -hmm. It was a lot more immediate and urgent that they had those answers. And so let's do the quick and dirty version kind of thing. Right. In four elements of traditional Halloween iconography developed around this period of time, witches, domesticated cats, the devil, and skeletons. Man, I was going to say cats and I was going to say skeletons. Let's hear from Lady Wilde one more time. Please, let's. The witch women say they can ride at night through the air with others leagued with the devil and change men to beasts and ride with the dead and cover leagues of ground on swift spirit horses. Hmm. Hmm. Spirit horses, huh? Spirit horses. The spookiest horse girls ever. Where are our spooky horse girls at? That's me. You're a horse girl? I mean, I you rode did ride horses. horses. Yeah. I was I feel like I was only a horse girl from like ages 7 to 9. Yeah. Then the internet happened, so. Mhm. Aim. Mm-hmm. Hey, well, the messenger, yeah. Yep. Had things to do. Yep. Got busy. Neopets to raise. Neopets. <laughs> <laughs> and Furbies to be afraid of. And Furbies to be afraid of. Mm-hmm. Thanks to Catholic influence, a robust fear of witches developed throughout this period, leading to the infamous and disastrous witch hunts that began in the 15th century. Now, a lot of people were still extraordinarily superstitious and therefore practiced some form of folk magic, especially apotropaic magic. So it wasn't exactly a stretch of the imagination that some people would be able to use magic for selfish or even evil purposes. But the Christian religion was able to take that one step further. Not all accused witches were female, but majority of them were. Books like the Malleus Maleficarum, which served as a manual for witch hunters, painted an image of women in service of the devil particularly women who were so loose with their morals as to have sexual relations with the devil. How dare they? How dare they? Scandalous. And this is interesting because it's a direct result of the patriarchal fear of female sexuality and therefore the patriarchal hatred of women. Boom. Boom, baby. Say that again. Say that one more time for the people in the back. Patriarchy hates women and their sexuality. (laughs) Men are afraid of women. That are empowered in their sexuality. Yeah. Terrified. I used to be. Yeah. You've evolved. 
I will say. Mm-hmm. I feel you have evolved since I've met you. But uh, it's something that is abiding. It's lasted through time. <laughs> Longstanding. It yeah. has not gone away. As Lisa Morton puts it, the witch trials solidified the image of the witch as a malicious hag with broom, cauldron, and cat, three symbols of feminine housekeeping. Mm-hmm. Boom. She nailed that one. I'm just, I've got hocus pocus on the brain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm seeing them. We were talking about before this, we couldn't wait to finish recording so we could watch the new hocus pocus. Truly. I cannot wait. It was said that witches would hold Sabbaths on the church's precious calendar nights. Because of this association with pagan history, Halloween was naturally the most significant of them all. And it's funny because, so the church just says- We don't like women. We don't like women. And our calendar days, our holy days are so important to us that witches would obviously, the the devil would obviously choose to mock Mm -hmm. our calendar days and make fun of our parties. They'll crash our parties. Sure. The parties that we took. (laughs) Yeah. The parties that you took. And exactly. That's the point is like, Mm. this is the hell of their own making. Of course. Yeah. They made all the shit happen. And then they needed someone to blame for all the superstition and fear that it created. The church is very big on persecution because the doctrines and the teachings of the church reward those who are persecuted for a just cause. Martyrs. Right? Yep. So, you know, in the case of these poor women just trying to live their lives and instead- (laughs) Just trying to get by. Being accused. (laughs) Well, I've started here hard enough and they're like, really? I'm in league with the devil? We need to feel persecuted. So we're going to invent a war between uh, us and you. It's going to be an us and them kind of thing because we need that. Also, we need conflict. Yeah. We need to feel like we're on the right side of something. Because if if you're not fighting an enemy, yeah. if you're not fighting something, then what are you doing? Like, what purpose do you serve if you're not protecting the every person from evil? Exactly. Luckily, you all have us to protect you with our magical oh, yeah. words and incantations. That's us. On a semi-weekly basis. <laughs> Witch confessions, much like other false confessions, were coerced and forced by those threatening to do worse if they didn't comply. That's right. And it's believed that many witches confessed to gathering on All Hallows' Eve during this period as another direct result of political agenda. See, Henry VIII (laughs) Hmm. was uh, actively trying to separate from the Catholic Church, trying to establish the Church of England and himself as the head because he wanted to divorce his wife. Mm -hmm. Speaking of a man who hated women. Yeah. Oh, could get into that. Oh, yeah. Could go on a real tangent about Henry VIII. And All Hallowtide was considered a papal holiday, and he was looking for any excuse he could come up with to convince England of their need to separate from the evil Catholic Church. They would basically, it's saying this trickles down to forcing false confessions, saying, Mm -hmm. hey, you confess that you used this Catholic holiday Mm -hmm. to commune with the devil. That they gave you the avenue that made it possible. And then he could paint the Catholic Church as evil and have his way. Yep. Just like old Julius Caesar needing Rome's support Mm. for his own personal gain. It just keeps happening over and over. I was about to say, the ripple tide, the ripple effect Mm -hmm. of history. Yep. And funny enough, not long before this, Martin Luther published his 95 theses Mm. on October 31st. Oh, yeah. I remember I studied that in in my college history class. I forgot about that. And I was like, hey, that happened on October 31st. And everybody was like, so what? And I was like, (laughs) who cares? That's Halloween. (laughs) And for those who don't know, this is what led to Protestantism Mm -hmm. and what made the Church of England possible. This was where everything diverged. Mm -hmm. Then there were two paths in the wood. It's kind of funny, like, seeing the Catholic Church knowing how powerful they are and how powerful they were and looking at like once they got good and going the world fell apart (laughs) yeah it's like oh wow it's crazy Mm -hmm. the association of cats with halloween is a bit more of a stretch if you ask me but it didn't help that many of the women accused of witchcraft did in fact have cats hey (laughs) yeah (laughs) sometimes you can't help what you are (laughs) Mm mm-hmm no. I love my cats. We might be accused of witches. Oh, I know for a fact you and I would be accused <laughs> of witchcraft if we were if we were alive in the day. Oh, we'd hang. Oh, we would hang. You're wearing a shirt with a yeah, rib cage I'm on it. So. A shirt with a skeleton on it. We would be mm-hmm. we'd be done for. Absolutely. Now, if you're a cat person, you understand this and probably find it quite charming. But if you're not a cat person, it's probably because you think cats are assholes. And funny enough. This may be the exact reason why cats are associated with witches and the devil. Because they have an attitude? Because they have a personality and, you know, <laughs> sense of independence. I mean, not all of them do. Not all of them. 
We've got some pretty dopey cats. We've had some pretty dopey cats in our lives. I mean, we're lucky. We are. Although domesticated, most cats are impossible to tame. Therefore, most cats scoff at displays of authority and thwart meager human attempts at dominance over their existence. <laughs> most other domesticated animals, however, can be bent to the human will. But to the highly superstitious and fearful, it may seem as though cats have a mind of their own. And any creature that won't submit to a man directly offends the Christian belief in man's dominion over God's creation. Oh, I see. These animals include cats and independent women. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> you really did that. It's funny. <laughs> so cats can be spooky. I'll admit it. There are times when I think, so I have two cats. There are times when I think there's a third cat in my house. I'm not going to lie. Really? Yeah. Kind of freaks me out. Uh, I don't know what. Because the way that they act? Couldn't tell you. No, I'm saying like you think there's a third cat because of the way that Sphinx and Atlas act. No, like literally I think there's a third cat sometimes, like a spirit cat. Uh, like it's a third entity in my house that's pretending to be a cat. Gotcha. Like it's spooky. Imitating a cat. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have told me this. Yeah. So cats do have an otherworldly quality to them, which may be why they were so respected and revered in ancient Egyptian culture. But it may also be their association with pagan Egyptian history that first marred any chance they had at being welcomed in such an increasingly Christian world. Yep. Potentially. It's just so funny to me. We're the church. What do we hate? Cats. Mm. Why do we hate them? Because. <laughs> because reasons. They're evil. Look at them. Clearly. <laughs> you see that one? Its tail fluffed up and it just ran across the field. Meanwhile, like my cat Phoebe just curls up into the smallest ball that you could ever imagine and <laughs> looks up with her big Phoebe eyes. <laughs> Aw. Atlas actually the past few nights has been curling up in my lap. Aww. He doesn't usually do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Buzz has been so sweet in the mornings. Like I've been waking up, you know, for work and when he he he'll be sleeping by my legs. But when he hears my alarm go off, he gets up purring and comes up to by, like my head yeah. and lays down on my shoulder. Oh. And I'm like, I have to get up, buddy. He's like, no, no, no. I know that. And he, he'll, he'll like roll his head over up. onto my shoulder and look God. up at me upside down. Like, no, you don't. What a sweet boy. Definitely been late to work this week. <laughs> he's won. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's won. He's going to win. If, if he does that, he's going to win. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. These men would hate, you know, women. Who, <laughs> they don't want to be manipulated either. They won't be manipulated, but they'd hate women who would make them feel something. Seduction. They probably also hate cats who make them feel any sense of like. Feel something. Vulnerability or that's like emotion. That's so true. That's so true. Like, aw, you're so cute. Anything, yeah. Anything that melts you in any way, shape or form is bad because you have to stay in control <laughs> at all times. Probably because loving cats makes you gay. <laughs> probably gay. The patriarchy, to be clear. The patriarchy. <laughs> but the most significant event involving witches, cats, and Halloween was an infamous set of witch trials in the 1590s called the North Berwick Witch Trials that Lisa Morton described as spectacular. <laughs> oh. I thought it was a funny choice of word. That is. Like a spectacle, but still. Sure. Protestant King James I was journeying to meet his queen to be, Anne of Denmark, when supposedly a group of Scottish witches were trying to interrupt his travels on Halloween night by tossing live cats oh, bound dear. to human body parts into the sea, which created storms and waves that would be much too unsafe to travel. Oh my God. That makes so much sense. Wow. <laughs> Tying cats to body parts and throwing them in the, in the water. Yeah. That's a wonderful Saturday afternoon. That's, I just can't stop thinking about it now. I can't stop seeing it in my head. So yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. If you guys get bored this Halloween season, if you're like, it's like a day in October, nothing to do, just go out in the boat. Um, oh my God. Tie a couple cats to some, you know, limbs, some arms and legs. Yeah, the body parts that you have laying around. I mean, some people do have body parts laying around. But... Mm, we've been watching Dahmer too. God. <clears throat> go all into that mess as well. Because of these uh, cats and these witches on Halloween, Lisa Morton says, Halloween was forever to be firmly associated with witches, cats, cauldrons, brooms, and the devil. And vacuum cleaners, if you're Mary Sanderson. And vacuum cleaners. <laughs> it's possible that the concept of the devil, or at least artistic representations of the devil, came from a desire to repurpose horned pagan gods into symbols of evil. The devil's first association with Halloween came about, as we've said, as the leader of witches. His demons, or little helpers, aka fairies, would accompany the witches as familiars in the form of black animals, mm. especially black cats. Go adopt a black cat. 
you're looking for something to do. Go adopt a black cat or a black doggy dog. Go do it. Please. I want a black everything. Me too. I want a black piggy. <laughs> I want a little black sheep. Oh. One early bit of Scottish folklore had to do with children noticing that their cats would be tired on All Saints Day hmm. because these cats had just spent a night carrying witches to their Halloween feast with the devil. Of course they did. Where they would enjoy nights of dancing naked in the moonlight, eating and drinking and participating in some kind of satanic orgy. <laughs> so cats would be sleepy all day oh. because it's not like a cat. To lay around For the house. 15 hours a day, that's right. <laughs> sleeping in the sun. They're, that's not normal. It's not normal at all. But this concept of witches dancing with the devil on Halloween night evolved from the fourth element of our traditional Halloween iconography from the Middle Ages. This icon is the skeleton. Mm, love it. I love a good skeleton. Me like, too. Story. Spooky, scary skeletons, man. So the skeleton arose in medieval pop culture as a direct result of the Black Death, which inspired an artistic movement known as the Danse Macabre, a.k.a. the Dance of Death. Mm. This was an artistic genre of allegory on the universality of death. It featured a personification of death, usually a skeleton, interacting with people from all walks of life, from princes to paupers, and dancing them along to the grave. Because of Memento Mori. I love that. That's one of the coolest things to come out of the Middle Ages. I mean, the Renaissance is fine and whatever, but like <laughs> dance of death stuff. The understanding of death. Just that like universal acceptance. embrace, the acceptance of it. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. And we really have gotten away from that in modern culture. Oh, we are so afraid of death today. Yeah. We're very far removed. It's very different. And thanks to Johann Gutenberg's printing press, people all over medieval Europe became obsessed with the gruesome skeletal figures. And this brand new concept of a grim reaper fit perfectly into the one night of the year when the dead were said to walk the earth. Let's also emphasize here the personification of death as a reaper. Coming to claim the souls. It's a direct reflection of the harvest symbolism that's so essential to not only the Christian faith, mm -hmm. but also Halloween iconography on the whole. It's true. Think about all the harvest, everything that's Halloween. He's got his sickle. Mm -hmm. He's coming and get you. He's ready to cut you down and bind you up. I always think of... Uh... Of The Sims. <laughs> Speaking of the early 2000s internet. The Sims? Yeah. You never had the Grim Reaper come to, the, to your house in The Sims? I don't think so. Oh, listeners are yelling at you right now. <laughs> <laughs> you could become friends with them in some of the versions of The Sims. It's kind of kind of cool. You could like invite him. He would hang out, eat pizza with you. By the 14th century, perhaps as a result of so much death, All Souls Day was added to all official calendars and therefore was observed throughout the Western Christian world. With the worst days of the bubonic plague behind them, the European world began its healing process. The physical, psychological, spiritual, and economical toll left many people, especially the British, with a much greater respect for the dead than the living, seeing as how there seemed to be so many more who had died mm. and were still alive. Haunting. Giving way to a distinct irreverence for the Catholic season of All Hallowtide. In modern times, people just don't care <laughs> that so many folks die. That's they true. They pretend like it doesn't happen. We're quite the opposite today. Yeah, it's a, we, yeah, it's we a very pretend. different reaction. You know, yeah. they came out of it with more reverence. And I think people, I mean, it's a broad statement to make. And I, I certainly myself don't feel this way. And I know people that don't, you know, feel this way. But on the whole, it feels like our society just decided, oh, yeah, whatever. That's uh, that's cool. We want to get back to capitalism now. Mm -hmm. it's so different. Well, some people don't even believe it. That it ever you know, happened at all. Sure. Well, some people still say the, the plague never happened, which is mind-blowing. There are plague deniers? Yeah. Really? They say that the Black Death never happened. Yeah. That, oh, my God. Even though we have record that it 100% did. Yeah, what's their reasoning? I mean, I don't know what I don't you... Really get it. Uh, same thing for COVID. I mean, we know it exists. All Souls Day was now often celebrated by wearing costumes resembling devils, angels, and martyred saints, which many sources suggest just looked like corpses. So zombies. <laughs> zombies, yeah. I've read that reenactment plays called Dance Macabres would be put on during All Hallowtide at village pageants and court masks, featuring the story of Jesus' life, from the Virgin Mary holding him as a baby in her arms, to where she held him after his crucifixion. 
ending with a most morbid parade of corpses from various strata of society and those of martyred patron saints reassuring crowds by their presence while urging them not to forget that we all die in the end. Oh my God. So it's like the earliest version of one of those like Christian horror houses. Yeah, absolutely it is. <laughs> Nailed it. Ding, 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 ding. Wow. I don't know if you guys had them where you live or if you were part of a circle that would have attended them, but a lot of the Protestant churches where we are from would put on these like haunted houses. Mm -hmm. So you'd walk through and think it was just going to be a fun Halloween experience, <laughs> but they would preach to you and make you say a prayer. And at the end, you'd walk through hell yeah. and they'd have actors screaming and yelling. Yeah. And, uh, Sounds exactly like this. Displaying various horror scenarios from A lot of them would do like life. the seven deadly sins. So they'd yeah. do like... Yes, yeah, through that lens of know, sinful nature. Yeah. There's drugs or whatever, whatever they deem to be sinful. Mm -hmm. Lots of like shame for sexuality. Oh, lots of guilt. Mm -hmm. Lots of guilt. A domestic, there was a domestic violence room one time. Was and they wanted her to forgive her abuser because so she was holding uh, bitterness in her heart. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, these are rough. Lord of mercy. But it sounds a lot like that. I mean, Lord have mercy on fear our souls. is a tactic. Fear is, is such a powerful motivator. Mm -hmm. And that was not lost on the Catholic or Protestant church. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. But we will for sure get into the history of haunted houses next episode. Can't wait. Can't mm. wait. Mm. It's going to be fun. Coming at you soon, listener. Too soon. Too soon. But as is human nature, the sobriety of the dance macabre would inevitably have to be balanced out by some jig of life. <laughs> so it's no wonder that the first recorded celebrations of Halloween began to appear by the late 1400s. One early tradition was a raucous ringing of church bells all night long on Halloween night. <laughs> oh my God. It sounds horrible. Where are Luke and Lorelai when you meet them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> King Henry VIII hated the bell ringing so much, he tried to have it abolished. And so did his daughter, Queen Elizabeth, when she inherited the throne. But many folks believed that the church bells would aid in the warding off of witches and evil spirits. And some parishes were so superstitious that their bell ringers would be repeatedly fined. Whoa. Especially the, the Welsh. Let's just say... The Welsh were very afraid of the dark. Oh, poor Welsh people. They were very scared. Man, I just am imagining bells, church bells ringing all night. All I would want to just lose my mind. I can't do that. I'd go crazy. It'd be like the Edgar Allan Poe poem, mm -hmm. The Bells. Any repetitive sounds are terrible for me. Mm -mm. No, I'd lose my mind. Especially what's even worse is a repetitive sound that isn't on the same chime or beat every time, like a dog barking, mm -hmm. like a neighbor's dog <laughs> barking that you just can't predict, but you know it's coming. Yeah. I've got one I've of those. been having trouble with that lately. There was also something really fun called the Lords of Misrule. Have you heard of that? Yes, actually I have. <laughs> yeah, it sounded really familiar, but I was like, what is this? Uh, they were known in Scotland as the Abbots of Unreason. Um, and on New Year's Day, they would uh, preside over uh, the Feast of Fools. <laughs> <laughs> as mentioned in part one, Halloween marked the beginning of the Christmas season. And all Tim Burton's people said, <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. And one lucky person from a household or a parish would be chosen as the Lord of Misrule, who would begin their rule and oversee merriment from Halloween until Candlemas Day, which is February 2nd. Whoa. It's three months. Three months of merriment? Yeah. Regular. You can't do it. Regular merriment. Yeah. This is like a master of ceremonies type deal, which is why I texted you one night. I was like, <laughs> what would you describe somebody who keeps the party going? What's it? You're like, is that an MC? That? I was like, yeah, that, that's what I would call an MC. That's kind of their job. And during these three months, there would be, quote unquote, subtle disguisings, masks, and mummeries. A mummy? Like mummifying someone? Oh, I think mum, the mummy comes from this. But mummeries were like basically medieval sketch comedy. Oh, fun. But it was silent, like mum. Mummery. Mummery. Keep mum. So there were silent little plays, but they were mostly comedic. So basically like the great grandfather of like the silent film. Yeah, totally. The comedic silent film. Absolutely. Man, humans were doing that for a long time. By 1550, Sawin had been completely absorbed into all saints and all souls. But as Lisa Morton puts it, these Christian festivals retained much of the pagan character, still offering both joyful celebration and somber contemplation of death. So... This is a big chunk of time. Mm -hmm. Big, big chunks 
of time. And a lot of these things, I'm just trying to emphasize like a lot of these traditions evolved throughout this period. And it's hard to say exactly when these things happened. Mm -hmm. But we just know the general. We just know that it did around this period. Mm -hmm. And as these things do evolve, it's an evolution. So it's one thing at a time that builds over hundreds of years until it becomes a new tradition that people have pieced together mm -hmm. year after year, season after season. A big collage. A big old collage of festivities and celebrations and death. And mostly death. And alcohol and also more death. Mm -hmm. So we talked about how there was the big festival of Samhain with the big bonfires and everybody came together and that was the big tradition and that played into their religion. Well, that religion is long gone at this point. But the tradition's still alive. So what happened was the big bonfire just became a lot of miniature, smaller bonfires that were more localized to towns and villages. And the Celtic descendants justified this by telling themselves that fires closer to home would serve as much greater protection against fairies and witches because they were closer. It's so more they local. kind of inverted the original... Mm -hmm. meaning or the original plan. Yeah. They just had to sort of adapt and adjust to everything that was happening. I mean, it makes more sense like in terms of practicality. Oh, yeah. It's much more convenient <laughs> and practical across the board. So they were kind of like, this. yeah, this makes sense. Mm -hmm. We'll do this. Yeah, sure. And it was more, it's more the spirit of the law than the letter of the law. Precisely. And also, when they didn't have a widespread religion to control it, where would the big bonfire be? You know what? Mm -hmm. What's the impetus? Yeah. How are we gonna? How are we gonna control this? Yeah. And when yeah. they couldn't do that anymore, it makes sense that it just became more on an individualized basis. Absolutely. They would also leave food and ale on doorsteps and along roads to appease the more malicious spirits. Never get rid of that. We keep doing that, don't we? Yeah, keep doing that. Well, see, this is where there's no proof that the Celts ever did this. We just know that their descendants did. Right. So these people at this time did start doing this throughout the medieval period. We don't know exactly when, but a lot of people are saying, yeah, that's, this just came from the ancient Celts or the Romans. Hmm. It's not the only culture to do this, though. You're like right. We talked about it in dark music. There's, there are, you know, Eastern cultures, Asian cultures oh, yeah. that did similar things. There were a bunch of different festivals of the dead all across the world the same time the ancient Celts were doing it. Or not doing it. <laughs> or not. To, well, I mean, you know, they were still celebrating, commemorating the dead. It just wasn't. So here's the distinction. It was the festival of the dead, not a festival of death. Two very different things. That is very different. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very different. Very important distinction. But leaving out food and drink to appease spirits... Pretty sure we have mischievous youths to thank for the continuation of these traditions. Mm. Um, I think they perpetuated that. They took the whole, like, we can do whatever we want and just blame fairies. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> Let's go have some fun. Wow. But we're going to get into the pranks and how that evolved into mischief night and everything. And trick or A treat. little bit here and trick or treating. A little bit in this episode, but we're going to do the broad spectrum, like the broad look at that next episode in part three. Okay. Americanized. Well, how it, yeah, how it originated in Europe and then came over uh, to America. And speaking of youths. Youths. Street youths. <laughs> this is about the same time period we get our first version of trick-or-treating. I'm so excited. <laughs> I, I it blew my mind. I, didn't, I really genuinely didn't know any of this stuff. Originally, this was a custom called souling. S-O-U-L-I-N-G. Souling. Mm -hmm. As in like All Souls Day, yeah. Yeah. Souling. You're acting like a lost soul. Help me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Help me. <laughs> Help Give me. me something. More or less, I guess so. On All Souls Day, and sometimes on Halloween and All Saints, depending on what uh, century it was and which region or country. Yeah, area. The poor would go door to door mm. in wealthy neighborhoods dressed as angels, demons, or saints. People would hand out coins, ale, or food, usually apples or nuts, as we discussed. Wow. But the most common treat was something called a soul cake. I feel like I've read this before. These were small, round seed cakes made with spices and with currants on top. Wow. And I've often seen them depicted with like a sign of the cross, like baked into the top of it, mm -hmm. like a big X or whatever. And these symbols of good luck would be given in exchange for prayers for the dead relatives of that household. So they weren't saying trick or treat. They were saying uh, treat and prayer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Give me cake and I'll pray <laughs> I give you for your prayer. dead husband. Don't you want that? Don't you want this random 
a person dresses an angel to pray for you right now? <laughs> like an hocus pocus and the little girl says, bless you. <laughs> and they all scream. <laughs> yeah. So the, the prayers were to help their souls be elevated out of purgatory. And I mean, I guess you need all the people you can get praying when it comes to that. You need all the help you can get mm -hmm. to lift them on up out of there. And we know that rich people love to believe in just weird religious bullshit like this. <laughs> <laughs> and also they don't like to do a lot of the work and heavy lifting themselves. Oh, Not to stereotype. You know all this They're shit. They're nice rich people. All maybe. this stuff was baked and compiled and put together by their servants and maids and stuff. They didn't, mm -hmm. they may have handed it out, maybe, but they weren't baking those soul cakes. Mm -mm. No. We should make soul cakes. I've honestly been thinking about it. Yeah. Let's do it. You want to this year? Yeah, we'll post about it. <laughs> yeah, we'll do soul cakes. And there are some other, actually, there's some other really cool food. Like a traditional, original oh. All Souls Day. I love to make like a pumpkin bread. Like you gave me your banana bread recipe. Yeah. Last you year. started putting pumpkin in it. It's really good. <laughs> I already made, I made banana bread one time this year already nice i'm already getting in the in the vibe mm -hmm. i'm feeling it but yeah we should make all these recipes this year be fun after henry the eighth established the church of england as the official religion souling looked a lot different it wasn't catholic anymore right so the custom stuck as a ritual during all hallowtide or around halloween that time of year but now it was called mumming in england and in Ireland and Scotland, it was known as guising hmm. because of their disguises. disguises or these costumes. And it all looked a lot like souling. It was all the same thing. Only now the prayers were for the people living in the household who were still alive, not their dead relatives. Mm -hmm. And speaking of guises, a number of sources claim that people opted to wear costumes during All Hallowtide anyway because... <laughs> Some crazy thing, like this would be the last opportunity the dead would have to take revenge on their enemies before passing on to the afterlife. So you didn't want them to know who you were. Right. So you would dress Whoa. up in a disguise so that they couldn't find you on, you know, All Hallows Eve or All Souls Day or whatever. And other sources said that it was the saints who would come and like, get you. Like, it's just super creepy. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know why they would need to take revenge before going to heaven, but... <laughs> I thought because you weren't good enough, obviously. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, but it's a good way to like tell people that you're guilty of a murder, <laughs> you know. Like, By the way, <laughs> uh, I'm dressing up. I don't want old Gregson Robertshire to <laughs> come back to tear me into pieces because I tore him into pieces a hundred years ago, or I don't know, whatever. Whoa, a hundred years, hundred years ago. How old are I'm... you, ghoul? <laughs> because <laughs> I myself am a demon. Oh, also, by the way, I'm a vampire. <laughs> Eventually, these customs were typically reserved for children. When adults would participate, it was kind of frowned upon. Although, for a while, um, adults did do it. So why did it become frowned upon? Because obviously in modern America, it just kind adults of, don't really trick or treat. Right. It just kind of became, it's hard to say. There are some examples where like it was just raucous, fun, bonfires, dressing up, going around. It was more of like a juvenile thing. It was seen life. as sort of juvenile okay. and immature. And when adults would participate, like parish priests would, you know, sort of like shake their finger at it. And then other people started to take up that same. Leave the cakes for the children. Yeah. Like don't, you know, don't lower yourself to their, you know, their level. When you became a man, you put away childish things. Exactly. These are childish things, you know, and the men are like trying to just have fun. Yeah. They're like, oh. Starting well, fires and. But I really like you know, soul cakes. I, I love soul cakes. <laughs> it's my favorite time of year. <laughs> it's my only comfort ever in this terrible, terrible world we live in. Yeah. There's this really fun uh, example Lisa Morton gave where they would like parade around with a horse skull on a stick and they would drape a like cloak over it. So you couldn't tell. Oh, yeah. Like you like couldn't really see. And they <laughs> kind of go around with it like a parade and like dance yeah. and go like demand food and ale. You know, they would get drunk and it was just seen as like it was debaucherous, right? Mm -hmm. Just adults having too much fun. And the, the church, church doesn't, doesn't like, like have yeah they don't mm. know, they don't like fun no fun is the enemy of the church mm. pleasure is the enemy of the church that's true mm. also why they hate women women are so good and pleasurable <laughs> and I just don't understand why I can't understand I it. don't get it I'm all about it <laughs> yeah that's a big thing ladies. for me just like <laughs> ladies in my uh, <laughs> I guess you'd call it a deconstruction journey trying to figure out like what parts of my upbringing still are relevant to me and matter to me. But it's something that I've realized that I've always, always just been totally against 
pleasure of all kinds because I was yeah. supposed to be. I thought I was supposed to be. We're told we have to be miserable. Yeah. We have to. The more miserable you are, the better off you'll be later kind of a vibe. Sure. And uh, yeah, I've found that doesn't really serve me or anyone else. It's just not good for us. It's not good for our human uh, brain. It's not good for no, the no, chemicals no. that we need. Yeah, you, could, you could argue from a scientific standpoint that we're literally designed to experience pleasure. Dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin. Yeah. We need all those things. <laughs> and just the idea of breaking down the shame around having fun, just like mm. goofing off, being silly, like letting down your guard at all. See, that's me. That was my upbringing. Yeah. You've told me that before. Mm -hmm. I still have trouble just being me. Like just letting go in any fashion is difficult for me now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because of that. Anyway. Let us have our Halloween. <laughs> and for a lot of these people, they took their Halloween. <laughs> when they tried to take it away from them, they just said, No. You can't. We're going to keep doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. Especially these kids. I don't blame them. So it varied depending on the country or region. But children would go around singing songs or hymns, reciting poems or scripture, telling jokes or putting on simple comedic plays, which we said were called mummeries, mm -hmm. or mums, or performing some trick or another in exchange for treats. Ah. You could say. So more like a performative trick rather than a malicious or yeah. um, deceptive trick. Like, look at us, we're kids, we're being dumb. Haha, -ha, give us an apple. Yeah. Give us some nuts. I want a soul cake. <laughs> and just so I'm not accused of whitewashing history, I will clarify that some of these comedic plays sometimes did involve early versions of blackface. Oh, no. Because the humor was often at the expense of dark, complected characters. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people still do this today as part of their Halloween tradition. Gross. And it's not good. Disgusting. We don't like it. We hate it, in fact. That's one thing we can lose uh, from this uh, history and this holiday. Yeah. That's one tradition like we, said, we can just People are always trying to look down on other people and they'll find whatever reason they can. Yeah. And it is disgusting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaking of controversy, let's talk about the day that took guising and mumming to a whole new level. What? This is Guy Fox Day. Hey. We first touched on this in our Mischief Night episode last October, a whole year ago. Wow. Because this is the reason we have Mischief Night at all, which in England is known as Bonfire Night. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now we know why. On the 5th of November, 1605, Guy Fox and about a dozen other co-conspirators organized a coup called the Gunpowder Plot. But it was Guy who was caught underneath the House of Lords with 36 barrels of gunpowder. Remember, remember, the 5th of November. Gunpowder, gun treason, powder, and treason, and plot. <laughs> These Catholic gentlemen were upset with how Protestant King James had been attempting to suppress their religion. So their failure was seen by England as a Protestant triumph over the papacy. Mm. And this became a night for anti-Catholic sermons and vandalism of Catholic homes Whoa. and businesses. That's where a lot of the like more violent mischief comes from. Yeah. This is sort of where it begins to originate in this time period. When Protestantism kind of was overtaking Catholicism. Catholicism. Right. Wow. Right. Just for the record, do no harm. No. Just don't be mean to other people. Just like we said, just because somebody thinks differently than you does not mean they're your enemy. Right. Ugh. So on the anniversary of this event, bonfires would be lit in the streets to burn effigies of both Guy Fox and the Pope. Wow. People would feast, drink, and light off fireworks in celebration. Children would go around begging for money to buy firewood to burn their effigies, which is another direct precursor to trick-or-treating. Yeah. They would smear their faces with charcoal and wear rags, pushing their effigies around in wheelbarrows or wagons, asking for a penny for the guy, hmm. a penny, a penny for the guy. Oh my God. And uh, <laughs> you mentioned earlier the remember, remember the 5th of mm -hmm. November. That's from V for Vendetta. Mm-hmm. Lisa Morton writes out a longer version of that that was from 1892. Wow. And they're still singing these little chants. And this was a version. I'm going to read that. 1892. Yeah. It was still being celebrated. It's still celebrated today. That's wild to me. Don't you remember the 5th of November? Is gunpowder treason in plot? I don't see the reason why gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. A stick and a stake for Queen Victoria's sake. I pray master give us a faggot. If you don't give us one, we'll take two. The better for us and the worse for you. <laughs> Faggot being like... Cigarette. Bundle of sticks to light on fire. Ah. Mm -hmm. Similar vibe. That's a fun, like, origin to the V for Vendetta comic. Wow. Great movie, too. And she said there's a bunch of versions. That was just one of them. Yeah, I feel like I've, re I've read that longer version before. So in 1647... 
Parliament banned all festivals except for Guy Fawkes, which had already acquired many of all Hallowtide's traditions, thanks to its close proximity on the calendar, just a few days apart. Mm -hmm. And soon, Guy Fawkes Day and Bonfire Night became the preeminent autumn celebration throughout Great Britain. Bonfire societies would oversee community bonfires and organize parades and parties. And that reminds me a lot of our Mardi Gras societies. Mm -hmm. They would make cakes called Bonfire Parkin. Mm -hmm. And they'd even make a bonfire toffee made from butter and black treacle. So just to clarify, like this was an all an effort to get away from the Catholic Church, to bring England out from under the Catholic Church's rule, basically. I would say that... Because they're banning celebrating anything, but... This, these are the people who, for the first time, were allowed to hate the Catholic Church. Right. So just because it was the official religion didn't mean everybody was Catholic. And just because the Church of England became the official religion didn't mean everybody just stopped being Catholic yeah, and, and became Protestant. Right. But for the first time, these people you now have a voice. You could voice your displeasure with right. the Catholic Church because it wouldn't it wasn't in charge anymore. And they would they would respond with bonfires, revelry, and acts of vandalism. Like because it got that's violent. That's how you get what you want. <laughs> it got violent, but it, it was seen as justified because it was seen more like a revolution. They prevented a revolution almost because the Catholics came back and tried to kill, you know, tried to blow up, mm -hmm. you know, the House of Lords. So it was like, wow, look at all the devastation we just avoided by capturing this guy. But also King Henry VIII, um, he began the whole like divine rule. Like he began the concept that he ruled because God showed favor God on him. God said so. Mm -hmm. Which is why, quote unquote, King James, they were able to capture Guy Fox because God prevailed over the Catholic Church. Right. Who were now seen as these this evil right. institution. That was God giving an answer, which mm -hmm. is the right way. God's just told you now. Yep. God just told you. And how many times has that been done throughout history, too? Oh, all the time, it's constantly. It's so easy. Whatever human will or humans feel like doing, they just say, oh, it's God. It's God's will. And this part's pretty sad. Bonfires were so popular in relation to British festivals for so long that by the 19th century, the hillsides were so stripped of vegetation, there was no longer enough firewood to keep up the traditions. Wow. They burned it all down. They burned all of it. Deforestation. Mm-hmm. Good bonfire. <laughs> Nowadays, they just do fireworks and parades. Yeah. Wow. But as I said, many people living in the British Isles in the 1600s were still Catholic, or they didn't care one way or the other, and they just wanted to celebrate Halloween. So they did. And there was still plenty of superstition and mystery to go around, especially in Ireland, Scotland, where the Celtic influence was still strong. And thank the great pumpkin, Charlie Brown, because <laughs> this was about the time that a new legend was being born. The phenomenon known as as the will of the wisp. Hey, we know about that. <laughs> yeah. Had been frightening people for a very long time. Possibly thousands of years. And it's probable that dozens, if not hundreds of different stories have been told throughout history in attempt to explain them. As we discussed in Jake and the Leprechaun, one of the most famous folk tales associated with these swamp gases features a man by the name of William. Mm -hmm. But there's another tale about a man named Jack. And his story although very similar to Williams, is arguably the most famous of them all. And we know where that ends up. See, the British, particularly the English, developed a habit in the mid-1600s of referring to any old regular fella as a jack. This has trickled down to things like jack of all trades, jack in the box, mm -hmm. and so many more that you'd get tired of hearing me say the word jack. <laughs> but today, we're most concerned with the jack-o'-lantern. That's right. The most likely origin comes from a slang term for a night watchman, who would be someone walking around in the dark with a lantern in hand. Therefore, people might refer to a night watchman as a jack of the lantern. Yeah. yeah. Or you could simply look at a guy holding a lantern that you don't know and be like, hey, hey, uh, the jack with the lantern, you, come over here. <laughs> light my candle. Would you light my candle? That was for you. That was, that was for you. Folks living in and around the bogs that are so common in the British Isles got so used to seeing strange phantom lights off in the distance that eventually it became something of a humorous expression to say, there goes Jack-o'-lantern. I see, I mm -hmm. see. There he goes. See him out there? That makes Look. so much sense. There's a man wandering around out there. Yeah. You see him? Oh my God. See him, kids? I can hear it like that. I love when history gets real like that for me mm -hmm. because that's the kind of stuff that I can imagine like, you know, being in the car and my dad would say something like that as a kid Yeah. and I would just pick up on it and, you know, like that makes it feel so human. Absolutely. Humanizes. 
historical. So it was easy to personify such lights or even to assume it might have been an actual mm. night watchman wandering around the woods with a lantern. Yeah, you never really um, knew. <laughs> you never know. Because the lights were often described as having the appearance of moving around, which is super spooky okay. if it's an actual swamp light. But if you see multiple popping up at once, you might see, you might think it's moving, you know, across the water or something like that. Mm -hmm. You might think it's moving when it's just multiple lights. But if you think it's a spirit already or a fairy or a person, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty eerie. Mm -hmm. This is also why these lights have been anthropomorphized into fairies and other malevolent spirits seeking to lure you out into the dark, cold waters where you were sure to catch your death. Like boggarts. Like boggarts. And it's from these scary bonfire stories and folk tales that we get the legend of Stingy Jack. Tell us the legend of Stingy Jack. So there are many different versions. And there's one that I liked better than this, but this is the most common one I came across in my research. So I think it's kind of accepted to be the most, uh, I don't know, popular. I want you to read this. Oh, geez. <laughs> Uh-huh. It's becoming a theme, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to read this. Thems and theys. I'll read for you. Yeah, buddy. Here we go. Wow. Y'all sit back, relax. <laughs> yep. Kaylin's going to tell you a tale. Pour yourself a pumpkin beer or a whiskey or something and just mm, light a candle. We're here in spooky season. Give us your spookiest reading. Oh, my God. That's mm. a lot of pressure. Okay. <laughs> there once was a man known as Stingy Jack. He was a silver-tongued drunkard who had such a reputation for mischief and manipulation that even the devil knew his name. One night, as Jack was walking home, the devil appeared to him in the road, informing him that his time had come. Thinking quickly, Jack convinced the devil to let him have one last drink. So they went together to a nearby tavern, where Jack had drink after drink, all the while thinking of what he could do to get out of the situation. Having no money, Jack convinced the devil to transform into a coin that he could use to pay his tab, the thing is, Jack had an iron cross in his pocket, so he put the coin in the pocket with the cross, which kept the devil from transforming back into his natural form. Insisting he be released, the devil agreed not to bother Jack for another ten years. Mm. <laughs> that feels very simple. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the devil wouldn't do that. The devil was a little more crafty than that, but okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Ten years later, the devil returned to collect Jack's soul. Thinking quickly once again, Jack convinced the devil to climb an apple tree and get him one last apple for his long journey to hell. The devil did as Jack requested, and while he was in the tree, Jack carved a cross into the bark of the same tree, which kept the devil from returning to the ground. Insisting he be let down, the devil agreed not to collect Jack's soul. Easy enough. <laughs> if it were that easy, everybody Everyone would do would it. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't too many years later that Jack's alcoholism caught up with him, and he perished. Arriving at the gates of heaven, St. Peter informed him that he'd lived a life of such wickedness that he couldn't be allowed to enter. Having nowhere else to go, Jack tried to convince the devil to let him into hell, but the devil remembered his promise to never collect Jack's soul. He turned Jack away, giving him nothing but a single lump of burning coal to keep him warm and light his way. Jack put the hellish light in a hollowed-out turnip, which he now carries around as a lantern while wandering the cold, dark earth for all eternity in search of a home. And if you aren't careful, he might just choose your household to torment. Boom. Dum, dum, dum. <laughs> Jack isn't the smartest fellow, is he? He tricked the devil. <laughs> I mean, he the devil. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't know why he wanted to go to hell, but... <laughs> wow. He, he didn't want to. But he just wanted than to purgatory. go somewhere. That's Again, like I said is before, it better than purgatory? like I said before, I kind of missed the days when hell was just as viable of an option as heaven. Like better than purgatory, right? I guess so. At least it's somewhere to go. At least it's somewhere to be. At least you won't be bored forever. Yeah, I don't know. Sometimes you just want to go where everybody knows your name. I don't know. I have too much religious trauma to get on board with that. <laughs> right. No, our version of hell is way scarier than apparently okay. medieval. The medieval yeah. version of hell. It has to. It, like they. They. Yeah. It had to be for them to survive and cope with life. That's why the Celts believed in uh, the land of summer mm. and Samhain. The song of purple summer. Man, we could get into spring awakening too, huh? We could, but we won't. <laughs> so. Thanks to Jack O'Lantern, O with an apostrophe now, as he's known. Mm -hmm. Jack O'Lantern. Jack O'Lantern. <laughs> Thanks to him, a new form of apotropaic magic was born throughout the British Isles, carving frightening faces into hollowed out turnips, rutabagas, potatoes, or radishes, 
setting them on windowsills or doorsteps to keep out spirits, witches, and devils, or carrying them around as spooky lanterns during all Hallowtide, when all manner of dark entities were said to wander the earth, looking for some place to haunt or someone to possess. A jack-o'-lantern is just apotropaic. Mm-hmm. It is just a means to protect yourself and your home. Which is why you want one on your front porch during Halloween. I love it. Love it so much. Listener, did you know that? <laughs> did you guys know that? Did you know that before? Are we teaching you stuff that you like to hear and learn about? I'm teaching myself stuff that I wanted to learn about. Yeah, you've been texting me all week. Like, I can't believe I'm like finally learning this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's just cool. As we've been talking about here, jack-o'-lanterns do represent the lost souls of purgatory. The elements that make this legend possible are the superstitions of the Catholic faith and the bleak outlook on the world of the post-plague Little Ice Age. So it doesn't just explain the existence of spirits, but it also stokes that fire of fear in the hearts of your average Jack and Jill, because <laughs> hell wasn't as likely as purgatory. Mm-hmm. If you aren't careful, you might end up like Jack O'Lantern. Wandering forever. Wandering forever. And in that in that time of like extended winter and super cold ass winters and darkness and uncertainty. That was, you don't that was wanna... just as bad as hell. That was their version of yeah. hell because they could very clearly, vividly picture mm-hmm. it. It was their own visceral representation of a possible fate. And you just know that you didn't Which want is, that. Which is ironically what the biblical hell is also supposed to be representing. The right. people at that time would have known the the Hebrew and the, the Greek words that are used yeah, right. in the Bible to describe hell mm-hmm. as this place on earth that was miserable. <laughs> Hell is because, a place on yeah. earth. <laughs> yeah. That was the uh, the idea, technically. Mm-hmm. And during the Middle Ages, it was. It was all supposed to be within our understanding. Yep. Yep. But the jack-o'-lantern was just one more step toward the dark whimsy that would continue to shape Halloween as a night of mystery, fear, and exhilaration. Tradition shifted from lively rituals performed around bonfires to ghostly rituals performed in both silence and darkness. Mm. We don't know exactly when or how it got started, but thanks to writers like Robert Burns, who, by the way, penned the poem, Auld Lang Syne, wow. we know that sometime during the 1700s, it became quite popular among unwed British youths to participate in in fortune-telling rituals. Mm -mm. And while these parlor games are often described as innocent and romantic, many of them send a cold shiver down my spine. (laughs) Tell us why. And we're going to get into it. I'm already like, yeah, I want to (laughs) play. Yeah, honestly, we could bring these back into modern day and it'd be like really scary. Modern Halloween. Um, I say that now, but teach me about it and then I'll decide. (laughs) And then you'll decide. A lot of these are very much like sleepover, slumber party games, Mm -hmm. like we talked about, like Mm -hmm. White as a Feather, Stiff as a Board. Very familiar. Bloody Mary. Ouija boards. I mean, people still do this stuff today. Yeah. It's really no different. A way to commune with the other side. Mm -hmm. To use spirits and the dead and even the devil himself. So Lisa Morton says the majority of these games served to learn the name, the character, or the profession of one's future spouse. Quoting, since marriage was probably the most important event in the life of a rural pre-industrial young person. Mm-hmm. We, I mean, that or carried in the American through South. into, <laughs> I was literally about to say that, that carried through into yeah. like grade school. What was the game we'd play where you, was it MASH? Is that what uh, it was called? Oh, you was write that it down the like, paper? the like the thingy? No, was the that's thingy? a cootie catcher. The cootie that's catcher. That's what I call it, a cootie catcher. A lot of people, what are the, what's the other thing? People call that something else too. Mm-hmm. I need to look it up. I don't know. I never knew the names of all that stuff. I just know that a lot of the girls like to play those games. Wow. And you didn't play them because you were a boy? They would bring it to you. No, they'd bring it to you and say, like, pick one. And then you'd pick one. They'd flip the flap over and say, now pick one of these or whatever. And they'd read you your fortune. Just a fortune teller, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, they it was a fortune it, teller. Yeah. We called it in the American South. We called it a cootie catcher. And I was very good at making these. They were some of my favorite. Like, that was so fun to me mm-hmm. at the time. You'd pick, like, a color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then a number. And it would tell you your future. You have to make one. You should make one. Oh, I'll make you one. It'd be fun. I need to look it up. I'm sure it would come back to me. I remember like the first three steps and after that it gets a little fuzzy. But see, we see how it carried through all, the, all this time. Mm-hmm. Hundreds of years go by and we're still doing this stuff. That was big time fun in the late 90s, early aughts. Early aughts. All right. So let's get into some of these, these things. All this plays into Halloween. It's in three sections. 
The first section is not scary, but important. <laughs> the next section is important, but also scary. <laughs> and then the last section, we'll get into some apples. <laughs> <laughs> Apple talk. Why was that so funny? We're going to eat some apples. One of these things is not like the other. <laughs> <laughs> it is though. You'll see. <laughs> and apples. <laughs> You'll see. All right. These are the things that are not scary, but they're important. Okay. But it's all like fortune telling. Okay. Basically. Um, got our parameters. Got parameters. It's all to predict the future. <laughs> all right. So Scots would pull kale stalks and the Irish would pull cabbages. Um, but either way, the shape and the taste of these vegetables would reveal the future beloved's character. So like round or thin oh. <laughs> or like sweet or sour. Sour. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. That's how you would know. That's how you'd know. We've always been obsessed with trying to figure these things out ahead of time, huh? Always. From writing your name like Kaylin Timberlake. <laughs> or like, that was my sister, Lauren Timberlake. Yeah, I was about to say, I don't think I really ever went through a Justin Timberlake phase. Who's somebody you were crushing on At when you were- At that age, um, Ryder Strong. <laughs> Ryder Strong? <laughs> yeah, from Boy Meets World. Uh, <laughs> Kaylin Hunter. Strong. Um, I may not have even known his real name at the time, but Sean Hunter was a big one for me. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, JTT, Jonathan Taylor Thomas. Oh, I heard he's on the moon now. What? Drinking moon juice with President Jonathan Taylor Thomas. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next one. All right, so this one I'm going to send to you. Okay, another assignment. Mm -hmm. Yes, Professor Mott. You'll get some of these. You, in the front. Hey. Read the next paragraph. Yes, sir, I can do this. Okay. Pull three stalks of oats, and if the third lacks grain at the top, the girl will lose. <laughs> I got ahead of myself because I read it before I read <laughs> yeah, it to you guys. You got, yeah, you got startled because these are like- I did. I got startled. 16-year-olds. Pull three stalks of oats, and if the third lacks grain at the top, the girl will lose her virginity before marriage. <laughs> hmm. That's one of the games they would play. I mean, hey, but w question, mm -hmm. was this mixed company- were these boys and girls, girls playing them? Was no, it was it? boys and girls. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So really, this was just like an early form of slut shaming. They would basically be like... Well, it was kind of like, ooh, like if you pull that, you're going to lose your virginity. Exactly. And it's like, ooh, gasp. Oh, no. <laughs> shaming. Like, I mean, sure. They, yeah, it was slut shaming. But um, Mr. Burns, the poet Mr. Burns, he had a version that's <laughs> in his poem about all these things. It's called mm -hmm. Halloween. His joke, his quip in that stanza is that the girl goes out to pull the oats and loses her virginity to a guy who's playing the game with her. Like they go Whoa. out to pull it and she does lose her virginity. She's like, okay. <laughs> it's called a tap pickle. Ugh. The top of the oats, that's called a tap pickle. I wish the, the listeners could see the face that I just made. <laughs> the grain. Yeah, I know, right? The grain at the top was called a tap pickle. I've never. And it was heard also of that. a euphemism for your uh, virginity. Wow. Your, your chastity. So you could lose your tap I pickle. I have truly never heard this. While picking tap pickles. Tap pickle. Yeah. Wow. The more you know. Again, we're humanizing all of our ancestors right now. All right. So another uh, version. In some places, Halloween was known as Nutcrack Night. Sounds violent. Mm. Just ask Andy Bernard. Oh, God. Ugh. All right. <laughs> These different versions consist of various ways to burn nuts in order to tell fortunes. Mm. You could like name some nuts. <laughs> After your suitors and throw them into the fire. Okay. The one that blazes the brightest and the longest would indicate the truest lover mm. of your suitors. That's actually really sweet. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm not sure how to feel about any of these. <laughs> so, <laughs> Because it puts ideas in your head and it's all just happenstance and chance. Mm -hmm. It's like um, peeling petals off a flower. Like, yeah. She, she loves me. me she, she loves me not. not. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Have, yeah. Did you ever, when you were younger, this is more of a modern version of this. But uh, when back when we had like an iPod or, you know, some yeah. sort of media collection that was not streaming over the, we could do it with the streaming service now too, but I just don't as much. Yeah. As a kid, would you ask questions as if it were like a magic eight ball and then, then like put it on shuffle? Oh, no, I never did that. I'd be like, is so-and-so thinking of me? And then I, whatever the song would be like, whatever they were thinking of me. That's cool. But that's like a modern version of this stuff. It's very similar. That's mm -hmm. the kind of stuff I would do. Wow. Interesting. I mm -hmm. like that. It's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Another version of uh, playing with nuts <laughs> is you could hide objects in walnut shells, um, two by two, and then hand them out at random to the party. Mm -hmm. And then those having the matching items were destined for marriage. Aww. Right? You know, that reminds me of uh, being a kid on the playground. This one, I hope that you remember. Yeah, like, like nobody wanting to play swinging. with me. Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> no. 
Oh, something if, else. So you're on the swings. And if you happen yes. to be going at the same speed as someone else and you line up, like if yeah. your swings align, that means you're going to get married. <laughs> yeah. That was so, yeah. like, I, that was such a thing at our school. To the point where they would pick on you for days if you, like, you know, line yeah, up. Yeah, it was this weird, like, ooh, kissing mm-hmm. in a tree, K I S S I N G. Yeah. We still do this, guys. Yeah. We still wow. do this, listener. Mm-hmm. Send in your examples of this. I would love to hear from like different parts of the world or like wherever you. Yeah. What are your What, what are your like, grade rituals? school or teenager, teenagehood rituals for divining the future? I do want to hear that. Please send those to us. Please tell us. You can have, uh, also have like a treasure hunt or like an Easter egg hunt style game with walnut shells. Mm-hmm. You could literally put something in a walnut shell because they come apart. You can just like tie them back together because they're, you know. Like a big, like big clam shells. <laughs> He's clapping his hands together. Luggy bowls. So you'd have uh, various bowls set before you. You'd be blindfolded. Okay. And then the bowl that you pick would divine your future. So like the example given, if you touch the bowl that has clear water, you're going to have a happy marriage. If you touch a bowl that has dirty water, you're going to marry someone who's not a virgin. Oh my God. <laughs> Tragedy. And there may be a bowl that has no water or something, and it's like, you're not going to get married. Wow. You know, spinster So you just reach out and touch something, and you you know, that's the bowl. Mm, yeah. Wow. Ooh, this is one of the other uh, recipes. Um, take a walnut, a hazelnut, some nutmeg, butter, and sugar, and mix it all together. Eat this before bed to have prophetic dreams. Whoa. Mm-hmm. Kind of want to like try that. concoction, I know. But it just sounds like a pie, like a cobbler that you can make now for Halloween. Yeah. And there's something called fortune cakes, which is a lot like king cake oh, that we yeah. have, where you hide the baby inside of it, mm-hmm. the baby Jesus. You would hide small tokens inside each piece, indicating their future. Mm-hmm. If you got a coin, you're going to have wealth. If you get a ring, you're going to have marriage. If you get a thimble, spinsterhood. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Or you choked on one of the pieces and you had no future at all. <laughs> because you died. <laughs> Shouldn't have put so many razor blades in that piece. Yeah. Whoops. Yowza. All right. And that's it for the not scary portion. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> let's, yeah, let's yeah, that's some right. I forgot now. where we were, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> it took longer than planned. All yeah, right. You really, uh, you set us up there and I just totally fell out of the structure. I build you up to break you down. Mm. It's my my game. That's a song lyric. So I'm going to begin this section with another reading from Lady Wild. I'm just so glad I can channel her for you guys, her ghost. Oh, I'm really grateful. I'm just so glad I can bring this to the show. Yeah, what would we do? The show. Mm. All the spells worked on November Eve are performed in the name of the devil. Uh Uh-oh. Who was then forced to reveal the future fate of the questioner. Hmm. Doesn't sound like the person I want to be getting my information from. No, I don't really want to ask him anything at all. Mm -mm. So some of this came before the spiritualism movement in England. um, But some of it comes uh, directly from that because there was an occult revival during the Victorian period. Mm -hmm. Not just spiritualism, but also for young adults in general. uh, Many of their holiday games were super dark and spooky and involved this kind of uh, old ancient world. Divining. Yeah. Divination and like superstition and just the occult in general. Magic, basically. A lot of this is contingent on the belief of a wraith or a fetch. Wraith is the Scottish word. Fetch is the Irish word. Um, This is the supernatural apparition of someone who is still alive. Ooh, okay. There are a lot of stories of this happening like somebody's supposed to be across the world and i saw them walk through the living room Whoa. like that's their wraith okay a ghost of a living person it has ties to the occult because it's supposed to be like a spirit wearing the appearance of that person oh yeah so that makes it scarier it's not that person but it looked like them right it looks you like know them. it's not that person like the time i was home i came home after school one day and nobody was in the house Oh, you've told me this one. And I was waiting for my mom because she always would come home Mm. at some point after me, like within the hour. Mm -hmm. I heard my mom come in the front door and I heard her like either say my name or be like, I'm home or whatever. And I was like talking to her about something. I asked her what's for dinner and she didn't answer. And I went to go like look and find her and talk to her. She was not home. No. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So I was talking to her wraith apparently. 
That's wild. Super spooky. Anyway. You, yeah, you've told me before how how much that freaked you out. Like you you knew that it was imitating your mom. It was imitating my mom, whatever Ugh. it was. Right. Yeah. Ugh. Just the fact that they know enough to do that or when to do that or how and how it will affect yeah. you. It's uh, startling. How effective it will be. I still hate being in their house when alone. I, I hate going there if they're, if they're not there. I don't like it. Man. It freaks me out. So here we go. Hope your candles are all lit, you guys. Mm. This stuff is spooky as hell. I'm ready. I gave these names, but they're not necessarily named this. This one I call Barn Wraith. Oh, okay. Enter the dark barn and take down the wet. It's a tool for winnowing, you know, the chaff off of mm-hmm. grain or whatever. The crop. Mm-hmm. The crop. After calling on the devil, one must pantomime using the instrument three times. Lisa Morton says, At the completion of this task, a specter bearing the appearance of one's future intended would pass through the barn. Oh. Mm. And she said that they would open the doors wide or take the doors off the hinges to play this game because they didn't want to be shut inside with the entity, (laughs) whatever it is. So, yeah, you're dealing with the devil here. You are dealing with the devil because you'd have to call on the name of the devil every time you did one of these things. Wow. And he'd have to divine the future for you. That's part of the the risk, right? I wouldn't have done that as a kid. I would have been I would have been like, let's pull some oat and uh wheat, whatever it is. Let's <laughs> go over there. <laughs> hey y'all, let's pull some oat and wheat. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll uh, I'll read this first part. I just sent it to you. But so a lime kiln for anybody who doesn't know is a large brick structure used for producing quicklime, and it would be a common fixture on 18th century farms. It's basically like a big ass oven, like a big open furnace type thing. So this is up to you to read the rest. Oh my God. Okay. It's spooky. So <laughs> <laughs> you would throw a ball of yarn into the pitch black kiln, holding on to one end, and wait until something grabs hold of the other end and tugs on it. Mm-hmm. Ask the specter. Who holds? The name you hear is the name of your future lover. Hell no. Mm -mm. Would never do that. For this to be so widespread that you can read about it, Mm -hmm. it had to have happened, right? Like kids were having this happen to them. Kids were doing this. This was successful for them. Yeah, it happened. Did they they hide somebody in the kiln, do you think? Sometimes, yes. So these were, some of these sort of, you can kind of go, Somebody just was hiding yeah. inside of it. Somebody anticipated wow. it, knew it was going to happen. Like they were in the barn waiting to walk through the barn, especially if you're a guy who has a crush on the girl. You want her oh, to marry you. you want her to marry you. So you walk through the barn. Yeah. So you're the one That's she sees cute. walking That's through the really barn. That's actually very cute. I need you to write a story that, that, that involves that. <laughs> That's so you know cute. I can't make it cute. I have to make it scary. <laughs> no, I want it to be scary, but I want to use the cute idea. Oh, okay. I got it. Ooh, because it goes wrong. He sees something he doesn't expect to see. Right. He thinks he's. He thinks he's playing the, the trick. Now we're on and something And he gets here. spooked. Now mm-hmm. we're on to something. I love it. I call this one the blind barley hug. Oh. Ugh. Yeah. Blindfolded. Walk Wittershins around a stack of barley three times. On the third round, walk with your arms held out. To accept an embrace. No. You will be taken into the arms of your future lover. No, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> and remember, guys, this is the wraith of your future lover. Mm-hmm. It may not be them. It may be a demon wearing the face mm-hmm. of the person. It sounds like a perfect ruse for demons to get real close to you. Mm. And also for, you know, people that have a mad crush on you to get real Ooh. close to you. But <laughs> I'm going to tap that pickle. Okay. These are fun. This is fun, isn't it? I like these. Yeah, I love this stuff. Okay. I say that before I read this. I have no idea what this is. I'm about to say (laughs) to you people. (laughs) Sorry. Okay. This one's called Dipping of the Sark Sleeve. Mm Mm-hmm. Dip your sleeve into water, then lay the shirt by the fireplace to dry. Sometime in the night, you will see your future intended enter the room and turn the shirt so that the other side dries as well. That's kind of wholesome. I mean, I guess so. They're taking care of you. Yeah. But Lady Wild writes about this in her book. Mm. Wash a garment in a running brook, then hang it on a thorn bush and wait to see the apparition of the lover who will come to turn it. One young girl fell dead with fright when an apparition really came and turned the garment she had hung on the bush. My God. 
You think somebody killed her? <laughs> so it was the apparition. She died of fright. Exactly. Don't know what these uh, strangle marks are in her neck for. I don't Weird, know. Weird, strange. Don't know what that's all about. Apparition must have got her. Strangled her. Forget the ligature marks. That shirt's dry as hell. <laughs> this next one's too good to just not read from Lady Wild. So I'm going to read it. Okay. So she says, Another spell is the building of the house. Twelve couples are taken, each being made of two holly twigs tied together with a hempen thread. These are all named and stuck round in a circle in the clay. A live coal is then placed in the center, and whichever couple catches fire first will assuredly be married. Then the future husband is invoked in the name of the evil one mm. to appear and quench the flame. Oh. On one occasion, a dead man in his shroud answered the call and silently drew away the girl from the rest of the party. No. The fright turned her brain, and she never recovered her reason afterwards. Oh my god. The horror of that apparition haunted her forever, especially as on November Eve, it is believed firmly that the dead really leave their graves and have power to appear amongst the living. I hate the phrase, the fright turned her brain. The fright turned her brain. Yikes. So I want to see that depicted in a movie, is all well, I'm saying. Yeah, that's terrifying. But also, was it just a man that came and attacked her or something? Could be. I keep going to the real world versions of these, mostly because it sounds so, I don't know, it sounds easy for a man to use to his advantage. Of course, absolutely. Or anyone seeking to take advantage of someone else. Not gender, not uh, important necessarily. I think that's possible. I'm sure that happened. I go more to the like... When someone's telling you about so and so who did Bloody Mary and what mm -hmm. they saw, mm -hmm. yeah, it's like okay, something happened to somebody that you, his, your cousin's friend's sister, and then and it's she's just, like just a, going, "That's a good story," and writing that down yep. in my folklore book, absolutely. But I'm sure it was used to people's advantage. Wow. But the most frightening version to me does resemble something much more like Bloody Mary. Stand before a mirror in a dark room with nothing but the flame of a single candle. Eat an apple in front of the mirror. Then your future lover will appear from the darkness behind you. Their face will be visible over your left shoulder. Shuck that corn. Yeah. No, no thank, thank you. you. I don't like anything to do with mirrors. I think we've talked about that before, but that scares me so much. Um, thanks for the offer, but no thanks. <laughs> thanks, yeah, but no thanks. If I I'm see gonna go. anyone's face but my own in a mirror, mm -mm. Mm, that's Getting it. out of here. I don't care who it is. Even if Ryder Strong appeared in the face. <laughs> <laughs> No, thank you. Oh, man. Once again, Lady Wilde takes this one step further. A lady narrates that on the 1st of November, her servant rushed into the room and fainted on the floor. On recovering, she said that she had played a trick that night in the name of the devil before the looking glass. But what she had seen she dared not speak of, though the remembrance of it would never leave her brain, mm. and she knew the shock would kill her. My God. They tried to laugh her out of her fears, but the next night, she was found quite dead, with her features horribly contorted, Ew. lying on the floor before the looking glass, which was shivered to pieces. Nope. <sighs> <laughs> Big time, no. No, nope. thank you. Mirrors are another thing for me. I don't know what it is. I think I've said before on the podcast, like, I purposefully angle my mirrors in my house, in my room in such a way that I can't see them from my bed or I'm not likely to run like up into them at night. Yeah. I, I always have my whole life. If I, if I was like going to go to the bathroom at night when I was a little, yeah, like little yeah, kid, same. I would always like reach my hand into the room first and turn on the light before I would go inside. You never thought something was going to reach out and grab your hand while you were trying to do that? No, I was too worried about the mirror. I see. I see. <laughs> I was too worried about what I would see. Yeah. I did realize recently that if ever I get up in the middle of the night, I don't look in the mirror. Yep. I definitely don't. I won't. I can't. Like I specifically just avoid it. I, I do now. Now I avoid it more so. I don't turn the light on. But yeah, me neither. Not as an adult, but as a kid, I always would. Yeah, I just don't do it. As a grown up, I need to keep stay tired so that I can yeah, go yeah, back you, to sleep. You can't put the light on because then you'll wake up too much. You need to yep. stay sleepy. I got to get up for work. <laughs> but if you ever do, just like look at yourself in the mirror in the nope. dark. I don't. I do my very best before. not to do that. I start seeing things I don't want to see. Me too. It freaks me out. Blech. But anyway. It's because we like stories like this. <laughs> I know. 
We do it to ourselves. And so do you, listener. Thanks for being here. So the main takeaway here is that I want some of you to get in there and do some of these old school, spooky Halloween fortune telling rituals. And I want to see document and proof that you guys did. Oh, yeah. Tell us. Tell us how it went. It's so fun. Did you see a wraith or a fetch? Mm. What's the devil like? What's the devil like? Ugh. <laughs> Well, speaking of apples. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that's right. You said apples <laughs> like a million years ago. Let's have apples. You remember talk. a listener a long time ago when he said apples was one of the categories? All right. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so these are um, fortune telling thing, more fortune telling things to do with apples. Okay. I like that they get their own category. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a nice segue. Eating an apple in front of a mirror to oh, just okay. yeah, here we good are. old fashioned eating apples in general. I like apples. You know, I told you that another name for Halloween is snap apple night. You did. This is where it comes from. Uh, So you would suspend an apple on one end of a stick. On the other end is a uh, lit candle and it would be spun around and you would attempt to snap at the apple. Oh no. Like with your teeth and get it. Oh no. The goal was to get a mouthful of apple and not burn not a face. mouthful of hot wax. Oh my god. And also probably get hit in the face with an apple. Yeah, smack in the face. Yeah. That's what I'm that's yeah. what happened to me. But see I have no spatial awareness at all. The imagery here is super sexual too because like mm. a mouthful of hot wax is right. Seems a lot like something else. It does. But this was incredibly popular for a long ass time. I am Hundreds shocked of that years. they didn't knock each other's teeth out. I know. I don't know how you do that. That's the alternate version of bobbing for apples, which we are more familiar with. I'd prefer bobbing for apples, mm-hmm. and I don't even like to do that. No, it's not fun. I don't like getting my face and my hair yeah, all wet. Yeah, getting like, everything it's like all you wet. Came to the party, you came to the party, you're like dressed up, and then you're in you costume. have like makeup or whatever, and yeah, you now you're bob all for apples. No. Stupid. I'm sure that wasn't an issue for back in the day, but. Probably not, but whatever. So for fortune telling purposes, you could carve the initials of your suitors into the apples and then see which one you get. Oh, that's cute. Yeah, I like that. You chomp at them all. That's simple. Very simple. Very easy to recreate. Or you could compete against each other to see the order in which you'd all marry. Oh, fair. What if, just hypothetically, (laughs) what if you didn't have any suitors? (laughs) What if you didn't, didn't have anybody knocking on your door or barking up your tree? I mean, you just wrote random initials. You probably just play to compete against other people to see if you would get married. Okay. You know, so if you so it was like in stages. Like if you were so young or you were so like. Well, you could just play just any version any. you want. This wasn't like the only way you could play. Right. There's a bunch of different games, so you just wouldn't play. If you okay. Yeah. And then if you're of marriageable age, or you could be like the guy in my then, class who would sit in the back of the classroom, uh, pretending like he's texting and his phone isn't even on. Really. Yeah, you would just pretend to have suitors. Do you think about him a lot? I do. I do think about him a lot. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, unfortunately. I wonder how he is. Um, Hope he's okay. He's not. Oh. (laughs) But anyway, so yeah, I think you'd either just make it up or you just wouldn't play. Gotcha. You know? Just curious, you know, hypothetically speaking. I don't know. Was that your problem? You didn't have any suitors? (laughs) That's clearly not your problem. That's a joke. God. (laughs) All right. So if it is just a game and you're just competing, uh, it could be fun to... Put coins into the apples or like other tokens, like we said before. Also a choking hazard. Um, Maybe a precursor to like razor blades in the apples. I know. That's... Never happened. I don't like the ideas this put into the heads of those more demented. It never happened. Don't worry about it. (laughs) There's never been a razor blade in an apple. It's never happened. We're here to bust those myths too. I'm sure we'll talk about that next week. That's next week. Another game would be to drop apples from above and try to spear them with a fork. Also dangerous, Concussion City. (laughs) I mean, or you could just be careful. (laughs) They weren't like bombarding you with apples. They were just like, it was like, you know, dropped from above and you just try to go bloop. You could still get hit in the head. (laughs) I mean, I guess so. These things are possible for me. Trust me. Hmm. You could cut an apple in half and the number of visible seeds would determine the future. Like you would say like one means this, two means this. I feel like I've heard of this one. Mm -hmm. Wow. And boom, your future is decided. Buy an apple. Easy as that. Oh, how I wish. Yeah, right. God. After bobbing or snapping, you could place the retrieved apple under your pillow for prophetic dreams. Hmm. Not rotten apples. Not rotten apples. No. Probably not a good idea. No, I'm just saying like it wouldn't, you know. 
You'd forget about it. And then oh, just leave it for like a week? Apple would rot in your bed and then the mom comes in and he's like, what have I told you about trying to Ew. tell the future with apples? <laughs> Again, with the apples. You're going to get bugs. I'm not taking it out till I have a prophetic dream. <laughs> I mean, kind of like Tooth Fairy stuff too. Mm -hmm. Putting it under your pillow. Or like a gun. Yikes. So my favorite apple thing... <laughs> My favorite I love how, apple. How uh, articulate we are about the apples. I haven't <laughs> written this stuff out. My favorite apple augury is to okay peel an apple in one long strip, mm -hmm. and then you would toss it over your left shoulder, uh -huh. and the letter it makes on the floor is the initial of your future intended. Wow, that's fun. I think it's pretty fun. In all of this, I'm just thinking about how difficult it would be for an apple peel to fall in the shape of a K. <laughs> <laughs> like impossible you never get married no i would never get married never okay but yours is like a c yours would be super mine be easy. easy but you have to like it's just sort of going which one does it look most like sure but it's gonna look most like a c very often and it's very rarely gonna look like a k i think it would probably most often look like an ampersand <laughs> more often than, than not that's true be fun to try sometime an s s probably, be probably. common Mm -hmm. Left shoulder specifically, though, huh? Yeah, like when you uh, spill your salt, toss over your left shoulder. Mm, that's what I was thinking of. All these old superstitions. Mm -hmm. They all come together. Yeah. And it's with all these occult semblances of such spooky romance that we will leave off for this week. Because Halloween is about to take a trip across the Atlantic and reignite the long-lost American romance with the ghostly harvest season. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. I'm pretty excited. I can't wait. This is going to be so good, y'all. And not only that, but we're in the midst of spooky season now. You guys are good and you're feeling it. <laughs> and Halloween is coming around the bend. You're good and haunted. You're good yeah. and haunted. Wow. It's a good time of year to be alive. It is. Happy, happy Halloween. Ooh. Happy Halloween, everybody. <laughs> yeah. We hope that you're enjoying this month-long spooky season. And if you are, you could go leave us a rating or a review on your favorite podcast platform. Mm-hmm. Very helpful. It'd Very be helpful. nice if it was a nice review. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a thumbs up. Tell a friend. Or follow us on our socials because we're always posting there. And then you'll know what's up for the next episode and all that good stuff if you're not already. Absolutely. We appreciate you. We're grateful for you being here with us and enjoying the season with us. Mm -hmm. You are never really alone. Mm. Not even in your love of Halloween. Never alone. Have a great week, guys. <laughs> Have a good one. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to That's Pretty Dark, written and produced by Christian Baxter Mott and Kaylin Andrews. Our music is composed by Jonathan Simmons, and our art is provided by Paige Garland at Power Girl Illustration. Join the collective nostalgia and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at That's Pretty Dark Podcast. Share your experiences and let us know what shows, films, or villains still haunt you from childhood at That's Pretty Dark Podcast at gmail.com. Remember, you're never really alone. So until next time, sweet dreams, everyone. <laughs>